Welcome, everybody, to today's Tuesday topic, vasopressors and vascular tone. My name is Barbara McLean. I'm a clinical nurse specialist, a acute care nurse practitioner, and I am currently the critical care program specialist at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And what that means is that I'm trying always to develop innovative strategies and methodologies to improve care and to also uh, promote higher learning for all of our staff, regardless of what their levels are. So for today, we're gonna to talk about vasopressors and vascular tone and really think about what those issues are. So a lot of times we don't really talk about vascular tone. We talk about blood pressure, but the question of vascular tone, which is actually the intrinsic capability of your vessels to dilate or constrict appropriately to blood flow dynamics and to oxygen demand at the cellular level. Very basic, very strategic, that ability of vessels to dilate or constrict depending on the end cellular demand for oxygen and depending on the blood flow. However, in critical illness, we often see an alteration in vascular tone, which we are presuming and assuming based on whether or not our patient has a normal blood and how they respond to the agents that we're employing, catecholamines or, uh, or hormones like vasopressin or corticosteroids, really thinking about that. And by the way, this is a question and a topic that's been around a long time. So in the Journal of Physiology from the year 1880 on the tonicity of the heart and the blood vessels, that was the first publication that I could actually access and find where there was discussion about the relationship, first of all, of cardiac output most particularly the stroke volume and the tone of the vessels and what that really meant to us in terms of patients' capabilities to sustain and maintain blood flow and oxygen delivery at the tissue level. So first and foremost, I just want to remind everybody about vascular tone, which is incredibly important in terms of understanding what's happening at the bedside. We want to remind ourselves that the vascular smooth muscle cells, what is actually in the muscle wall, most particularly of the arteries, some distribution in the vein and no distribution in the capillary, but that, that muscle wall and how it's stimulated. So I want you to think that very similarly to cardiac muscle, your vascular smooth muscle requires significant stimulation and a uh, regulation of ions, ions like potassium, ions like calcium, in order to respond to stimulation and to have appropriate vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Now, in the generalized world of understanding, we're just going to remember that more stimulation, sympathetic stimulation, more catecholamines should always yield a higher level of vascular tone and vasoconstriction and less stimulation. So either we're blocking sympathetic stem or we have primary parasympathetic stem and a reduction in neurotransmitters will yield more dilation and less vascular tone. Now that's the that's the presupposition. That's what underlies our understanding about vascular tone. If I stimulate your smooth muscle of your vessel, you should constrict. Now you apply that every day because when you're using norepinephrine, when you're using epinephrine, if you're using dopamine, you are expecting that the vessel will constrict and your measurement of that is related to the blood pressure. Because of course you can't see what the vessel is doing. You're just making an assumption based on the patient's blood pressure. But I do want to remind you that the majority of tonal responses in the artery, there is no tone in the capillary. It's all dependent on pre-capillary pressure, pre-capillary volume, and that the veins do have some tone. They do respond when you add a vasoconstrictor like norepinephrine or epinephrine. Your veins will actually have some constriction, but it will not near, be nearly as profound as arterial response 
to vasopressors. So we do want to consider the importance of our veins here. And a lot of times we're not really thinking about venous application and venous response to our vasopressors, but very, very important to remember that venous return depends on venous tone, and it also depends on the most particularly the mean arterial pressure, which is pre-capillary. So mean arterial pressure, pre-capillary, capillary, and the veins. And the veins will ultimately return blood to the right atria, which then, of course, fills the right ventricle. So something that's really important for us to consider, and we'll see a graphic in just a moment, is that what you really want to achieve is a relatively stable and elevated mean arterial pressure and a relatively stable and lower CVP so that the gradient between the artery and the vein is maintained. And you always would like that to be at least 50 millimeters of mercury or better. So if you think about being at the bedside and you have somebody who's got a CVP of 18 and a mean pressure of 75, you've got a really great pressure gradient and blood should move smoothly from artery through capillary to vein. But as that, that gap or that difference narrows, what you're going to see is a reduction in that blood flow dynamic. Now, a lot of times people don't talk about the importance of venous return, but every single one of you apply this every day at the bedside. When you have patients who have interstitial edema, that interstitial edema occurred because you have a failure of venous return and you have engorgement of your veins, which then promotes a shift in the fluid into the interstitium out of the vessel. So these are really important concepts. When I'm applying a vasopressor, my number one goal is to increase the vascular tone of the artery, but I also need to be aware that the veins, which are normally capacitance compliant vessels, will also respond with some constriction, which may then further exacerbate fluid loading into the interstitium. Okay, so very important for us to remind ourselves that the right atrium and right ventricle, uh, the volume in the right ventricle at the end of ventricular filling, that's known as end diastolic volume, is profoundly affected by your total blood volume, no surprise there, but also by your venous pressure. So this is really critical because when we talk about critically ill patients, patients who are intubated on positive pressure ventilation, who are in high peeps, who have uh, pulmonary edema, we want to remind ourselves that as the intrathoracic pressure goes up, that's going to communicate to the right ventricle, which means the right ventricular pressure goes up, which means that the right atrial pressure must go up in order to fill the right ventricle, and the venous pressure must go up in order to fill the right atria. So vein to right atria to right ventricle, which is profoundly impacted in our critically ill patients. And now we add vasopressors because they're hypotensive and they have poor arterial volume. Now we're adding vasopressors, which may actually make this significantly worse. So we're going to keep an eye on this prize here. We're going to remind ourselves that the veins are normally storage vessels. Two thirds of your total blood volume is found in the veins. When you get to three fifths of your total blood volume being stored in the veins, you're going to start to exacerbate that volume into the interstitium. Now, normally your veins are going to have a low pressure. So one of your ultimate goals is you'd like to get mean arterial pressure up and keep your CVP down. That allows that pressure gradient, which approximates the better movement of volume to go from artery to vein. Now, in addition to that, we just want to remind ourselves about the components of blood pressure. And I know anybody who's ever listened to me knows exactly what I'm going to say here, that your systolic arterial blood pressure, 
is always a reflection of the response of the artery to ventricular ejection. So the thing that really correlates to systolic blood pressure, the most important one, is your LV ejection or your stroke volume. The stroke volume ejected by your left ventricle and your systemic arteries is really what's going to be reflected here in your systolic pressure. Now, vascular tone is also important because if your vessel is stiff or your vessel is dilated, that's going to affect the amount of pressure that is generated when the LV ejects. But when we're talking about therapeutic intervention, if our problem is primarily systolic pressure, what we want to do is improve ventricular ejection. Now, sometimes that's really hard to do. Like in the case that we're going to look at, we have a patient whose ejection fraction is less than 20% and ultimately less than 5%, which means very hard to maintain a good systolic pressure because he has poor stroke volume. Now, we remember that our arteries are elastic, and when the LV boluses that blood out into the arteries, they dilate, and then they recoil, okay? Dilate, and then recoil. And recoil is actually what we're going to call, we're going to call our vascular town. So for diastolic pressure, what we're really looking at is the recoilability of the arteries after we've had a bolus of blood from left ventricular ejection into the arteries, the recoil of the artery, which actually is vascular tone. So quite simply, and not 100% reliably, but just in general, when you walk into the room of a critical patient who has an A-line, this is not going to be meaningful for non-invasive blood pressure because it's not continuous and your pressure changes all the time. So with an A-line, you're going to look at systolic pressure as a reflection of LV ejection and stroke volume, and you're going to look at diastolic pressure as a reflection of vascular tone. So just those simple strategies mean that if I go into the room and I have a patient who has a systolic pressure of 94 and a diastolic pressure of 38, their problem is most likely vascular tone. Now I can give them volume and that may raise their diastolic pressure a little, but what they actually need is vascular tone. So I have to think about the components of vascular tone. I have to consider, does this patient need increased neurotransmitter or catecholamine, that would be norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, phenylephrine? Or does this patient need to have standardized ions? Is he hypokalemic? Is he hypocalcemic? Is he acidotic? All of those things which affect the ability to maintain vascular tone. So it's not really so simple as just adding a vasopressor and praying that your patient's blood pressure is going to come up. We really have to understand what the target and the endpoint is. Now, ultimately, no one is writing for you to increase diastolic pressure or to increase systolic pressure. They're always talking about mean arterial pressure. And the reason mean arterial pressure is abundant in the literature and the evidence and in our practice is that if you look at this schema, you see right here, this is what the left ventricle is generating, a systolic pressure of just around 122 and a diastolic pressure close to zero. So that left ventricle contracts and generates a high pressure, opens the aortic valve, boluses the artery with the stroke volume. And once the aortic valve closes, what I'm looking at is the pressure now in the artery. And the big difference is the diastolic pressure, right? It's almost the same systolic pressure because that's what the left ventricle had to generate to bolus blood out. But the diastolic pressure has changed significantly between the ventricle and the artery. And as that volume moves forward, into the arterioles and into the capillaries, you see a reduction in the difference between the high peak systole and the diastole. And now you're just looking at an average pressure that is driving blood flow through the capillary into the veins and ultimately to the right atria. So whatever has been ejected out here from the LV into the arteries, generating that mean pressure, that mean arterial pressure, which is what drives that blood flow through the arterioles, 
the capillaries, the veins, all the way back to the right atria, which is why this is so important. Because when we talk about resistance and we talk about resistance measurements, right? We can't measure resistance. We just calculate it. We take the average pressure in the artery, that's the map, and the terminal pressure in the vein, that would be the CVP, and MAP minus CVP is what is really going to tell us about resistance. Just MAP minus CVP. So you would like that difference to be 50 or greater. And that's what you're doing when you're adding vasopressors is you're trying to improve that gradient in order to restore a blood flow pressure, terminal point, the filling of the right atria. So MAP minus CVP. Now, if I'm doing a true resistance calculation, that would be an SVR calculation. It would be MAP minus CVP divided by your cardiac output and then using a standard factor to convert to dynes, and that standard factor would be 80. Now, if you're in an ICU and you have an A-line in your patient and you've attached a flow track transducer, you're measuring arterial-based cardiac output, you're looking at, you can do a calculated SVR. You can do a calculated SVR if you have a PA catheter. But if you don't have a measure of cardiac output, you're just going to assume resist, uh, you're going to assume resistance evaluation simply by taking MAP minus CVP and saying that gradient's got to be greater than 50. When the gradient is smaller than 50 and your CVP is up, this tends to be a cardiac problem. When your gradient is lower than 50 and your CVP is down, this tends to be a stroke volume problem. It's pretty straightforward. And we apply that back to the understanding of vascular tone because without vascular tone, I cannot manage the continuous pressure gradient that drives blood flow through the capillaries and delivers oxygen at the tissue. So this is why we use MAP. It's a more constant indicator of flow. I want to remind you that we don't measure MAP. It's always a calculation. The calculation of MAP is dependent on your heart rate and the amount of time that you spend in diastole. So the primary calculation that we use is diastolic pressure plus pulse pressure, which is the difference between systole and diastole, divided by three, meaning that you've got a cycle time that is heavily trended towards diastolic pressure. So first and foremost, I just want to remind you that when your patient's heart rate goes up, less time is spent in diastole, and as the heart rate goes up, you will see that the MAP starts to drop. If you're using an MAP that is calculated from your bedside monitor, as the heart rate goes up, the MAP starts to drop. So you might say, and you'd be really smart to do it, why is it that we don't control the heart rate? Well, in a cardiogenic shock patient, we might control the heart rate because we don't want the myocardium to be working so uh, rapidly and to be consuming that much oxygen. But a rapid heart rate is a compensatory mechanism. And typically it's a compensatory mechanism because my actual cardiac output, my actual flow has gone down. So the heart rate goes up the actual flow being stroke volume, I'm so sorry, the stroke volume is down. So the heart rate goes up to sustain a more viable cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. The number one compensation is to increase the heart rate. But as the heart rate increases, you're going to start to see that the MAP drops. So put that together when you're at the bedside. I'm not saying you're going to go in there and you're not asking to do beta block therapy because tachycardia is the compensatory mechanism for your patient. But you need to pay attention to tachycardia. If you have an A-line, look at the effect of tachycardia on the mean arterial pressure. As heart rate goes up, MAP will start to drop because you're going to spend less time in diastole, which means 
from the ventricular perspective, less time for filling and therefore less volume in the ventricle, meaning less volume being ejected. So the stroke volume starts to drop. Now the cardiac output might be okay because it's heart rate times stroke volume, but the actual efficiency of the left ventricle has been profoundly affected. So we come back and we say, we want to look at MAP. There's a lot of value in the calculated MAP. You have to have a constant pressure that maintains arterial blood flow, not arterial, arterial and capillary blood flow. You've got to have a constant pressure column. And that's why we add vasopressors quite rapidly when we see that patients have a low MAP or a low diastolic pressure. Okay, so when we talk about MAP, we're always going to remember heart rate times stroke volume equals cardiac output. And we actually have a normal process, which is to increase or decrease the radius of the artery, vasodilate or vasoconstrict, which of course affects the resistance. The more resistant the artery, the harder it is for the heart to empty. So when we believe there's arterial resistance, we typically, and we have a patient who's somewhat shocky, we will typically dilate the artery to reduce the resistance so it's easier for the heart to unload. And that often is an early strategy in a cardiogenic shock population. In a hypovolemic shock patient, the problem is that you have a low stroke volume because you don't have adequate volume. So of course, with those patients, we're gonna give them blood volume. We're gonna give volume to increase their venous return, increase their stroke volume, thereby increasing the cardiac output and reducing the heart rate. And the total peripheral resistance will decrease because we will now see that the artery dilates. So really, really important for us to appreciate that the primary uh, consideration here is short-term control, when we're talking about critical patients, typically we're looking at short-term control of mean arterial pressure. And when we're talking about this in, in this talk, we're talking about patients who have hypotension. They have hypotension with hypoperfusion, which indicates shock. The short-term control that they will elicit themselves is to increase sympathetic stimulation and increase circulating neurotransmitters. So I will activate my sympathetic nervous system and I will increase the neurotransmitters because stimulation from the sympathetic nervous system cannot get across the little space known as the synapse without a neurotransmitter. This is short-term control. This is what your patient is gonna do as soon as mean arterial pressure drops. And what they'll have is another, also another response, which is a longer term. Now, I don't mean two weeks, but takes a little bit of time. And that is to have the release of a vasopressor from the kidney and also the reabsorption of water so we can increase stroke volume. Now, that's why, along with these things that we're talking about here, increased heart rate, reduced diastolic pressure reduced mean arterial pressure and a reduced urine output are all keys that tell you that you have a patient who has failure of their endogenous response. And that's really what's important. You and I, we, we have a stressor. Um, immediately, we have some kind of a stressor. We have hemorrhagic shock. We have a GI bleed. We're in a motor vehicle collision immediately what's going to happen is increased sympathetic stimulation, neurotransmission, and immediately we're going to have some short-term control. Now, if we sustain loss of volume because we're hemorrhaging, that's going to overwhelm the capability for that short-term control. And that long-term control will not have kicked in yet and won't be enough to overcome this response. So really important in terms of how we're applying this at the bedside and understanding this very delicate balance that is under primarily under sympathetic nervous system control. So mechanisms that really help us to regulate our blood pressure, first and foremost, the single most important, most rapid, and the one you recognize by seeing a patient who has 
tachycardia for the majority of patients, unless they're on beta block therapy, they're going to have tachycardia. That is their primary rapid acting mechanism for the regulation of blood pressure. So that regulation of blood pressure requires an intact sympathetic tree, and it requires a communication from receptors that live primarily in the aortic arch and the carotid arteries that say, not enough volume, not enough pressure. And that stimulates the sympathetic nervous system to actually exert control. Um, in addition to that, there are chemoreceptor stimulations. We'll talk about that in a few minutes because that's a really important one for us to be considering at the bedside. And then we think about some of the intermediate or longer term control. That's really gonna be related to reminding yourself about the kidney. And we're gonna take a look at that in a moment, that as blood flows into the filter of the kidney, there are small receptor sites there. That receptor site, when recognition of low volume and or low pressure, that receptor site releases renin, which converts into angiotensin, angiotensin one and angiotensin two. And angiotensin two, by the way, the most potent vasoconstrictor known to man, um, but you have to have, you have to have some renal volume and renal pressure to consider that institution of the renin angiotensin and terminally the aldosterone access. Aldosterone actually creates salt and water reabsorption. So sympathetic nervous system stimulation stimulated by baroreceptors have to have a good central nervous system, have to uh, have some chemoreceptor stimulation as well. Intermediate acting renin angiotensin, which then affects the vasculature and the vascular tone. That angiotensin affects the vascular tone. Also promotes some fluid shift for adjustment of blood volume and typically fluid shifting into the vessel immediately. And then also the release of aldosterone, which stimulates the reabsorption of salt and therefore water. So again, that short-term stimulation increasing sympathetic activity, decreased sympathetic activity. So what you're going to see is an increased heart rate. And that is really important. Tachycardia should never be seen as normal. You might tell your provider, I'm concerned about the persistent tachycardia, the patients at 125, 130, 138, 145. I'm concerned about persistent tachycardia. And typically the response will be, well, that's a compensatory mechanism. Yes, it's compensatory until either the patient gets better or he gets worse. So I wanna pay attention to that compensatory message. I want to remember that when I see an increased heart rate, the probability is I have increased contractility, but a shortened diastolic time. So overall, my stroke volume may go down. That when I see an increased heart rate, I also should assume that I have increased vasoconstriction, which means limitation of blood flow to non-essential areas. Those are areas that don't require a lot of oxygen. And that my adrenal gland related to that sympathetic activity is going to release more epinephrine and more epi norepinephrine. Now that's gonna enhance the heart rate. That's also gonna enhance the vasoconstriction. So it's gonna, we should see in response to this an increase in blood pressure. So when I see an increased heart rate and hypotension, I have to now say, I have an increased heart rate and I have hypotension. I have some type of failure of my sympathetic stimulation of my renin angiotensin aldosterone access or of my epinephrine and norepinephrine. Those are questions you should be asking rather than just starting your patient on 10 of norepi, titrating it to 20, 30, 40, 50, and you don't have a response. The question is, where is the failure? And why is it that when I am giving my patient extraordinary doses of neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, epinephrine, a hormone, vasopressin, or maybe even cortisol, why is it that my patient is not responding? That is a question that we need to be asking when we're at the bedside and we're treating hypotension because the normal response would be to increase the vascular tone, vasoconstrict, raise the blood pressure, particularly the diastolic pressure and the mean arterial pressure. So again, we're just going to remind ourselves 
how MAP is maintained is that when there is sensation at the baroreceptors, those baroreceptors and those chemoreceptors, and they're in many places, you can see all of this afferent, that means the receptor technology. So your baroreceptors, your chemoreceptors, your cardiopulmonary bar baroreceptors, when those are stimulated, or when those respond to low volume and low pressure, they encourage the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. And because they encourage the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, what we expect to see is an increase in the cardiac output because of tachycardia. We're going to assume an increase in vascular tone or vascular resistance, which should then cause an increase in the blood pressure to maintain MAP. So I'm going to reiterate to this to you again. When you see sustained tachycardia, you should expect the ability to normalize the blood pressure. And when the blood pressure cannot be normalized with tachycardia, you've got a failure. You've got a failure in the uptake at the uh, receptor sites in the vessels to actually stimulate vascular tone. You might have some ionic disturbance. You may have acidosis. You may have other events that are causing the failure of vascular tone and vasoconstriction. Oh my God, so incredibly important. So again, we just remember MAP is maintained by that vascular anatomy and the vascular factors. Can my vessels, particularly my arteries constrict? And what's happening at a cellular level, ionic abnormalities, metabolic acidosis, that actually cause an alteration in my vascular factors. And to remember that all of this sympathetic stimulation, neurotransmitters, endogenous or exogenous, so my patients on norepinephrine and epinephrine, that's all going to change venous compliance. That's going to raise your CVP, and that should increase the volume load back to the heart. As long as my MAP minus my CVP is greater than 50, it should actually activate better blood flow dynamic back to the heart. So this is incredibly and profoundly important when we're looking at our patients. Um, there are some other things that are critical here, probably a little bit beyond what we're talking about here today, but the lining of your blood vessel also has a lot of control on vascular tone. It releases vasoconstrictors or vasodilators uh, that are in relationship to the pressure and volume that finds that itself in the arteries. And then finally, just to remember about the function of the kidney. Okay, the kidney, when pressure or volume reduces, that's a renal hemodynamic change, will actually release renin, convert it into angiotensin 1 through the marriage of angiotensinogen, which requires good liver function. The angiotensin 1 travels in the blood to the lung, where it's converted to angiotensin 2. This is a potent, smooth muscle stimulate, stimulant. So, I just like to remind you that angiotensin II is one of the most potent vasoconstrictors known to man. You can administer that to your patient as angiotensin II, also known as geopressa. We'll talk about that just for a moment at the end of the talk. But what also happens when we have renin angiotensin release is then the stimulation of aldosterone. Aldosterone promotes sodium and water reabsorption in the distal tubules of the kidney. So you can see here, there's just a lot of information. It's just really great information to just say that when we have sympathetic stimulation, there are direct effects from sympathetic stimulation on the kidney. And the kidney has two major components in helping you maintain your MAP. The release of ultimately angiotensin II and the reabsorption of water, which means as urine output starts to decrease, that's a canary. It's telling you that you're, you're actually behaving as you should by reabsorbing water and not releasing it in urine output. 
So you've got to be paying attention to that. It happens early on. We dropped a Foley, you were 50 mLs, now you're 30 mLs, now you're 20 mLs. Let's not wait to talk about why the urine output is decreasing. And let's not wait to do a chemical evaluation about failure of the kidney, which would be an increase in creatinine. And even small increases in creatinine are telling us that we, we primarily have some kidney dysfunction. Last but not least, I just want to remind you about chemoreceptors, okay? So when you're hypoxemic or acidotic, so your PO2 or your pH are down, you're hypoxemic or you have acidosis, and the causative factor for acidosis, the hydrogen ion, which is your metabolic acid, is up, or your PCO2 is up, you're going to stimulate your vasomotor center. That vasomotor center means that you stimulate sympathetic nervous system and neurotransmitter release. Okay, always that should happen. So now my patient has tachycardia, so that increases his cardiac output, and it should promote vasoconstriction. It should promote vasoconstriction. And that vasoconstriction should be more arterial than it is venous, which then should speed and promote the return of blood from the artery through the capillary to the vein to return that blood volume to the right heart. So again, sympathetic activity and vasoconstriction. That happens in seconds or minutes. And that also means that when you put a patient on norepinephrine or epinephrine, within two to three minutes, you should see response if the patient is able to respond. It's a really rapid response. And oftentimes it can increase your pressure two times normal in five to 10 seconds. So by the way, give your patient a moment to respond, right? Because a lot of times you're hyper, you know, you've got sympathetic stem. Oh, my patient's pressure is low. I've started norepi. He isn't responding. Let me go up, 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 up. And by three minutes, you're already at 50. And you may have been able to achieve good control at a lower dose. Sometimes we can't wait because we're so concerned about hypotension. We're worried about myocardial infarct and cerebral infarct. And we're really concerned about hypotension. We don't want the patient to die in front of us. But you do need to give a, a moment in time, more than five seconds, more than 60 seconds, if possible, to allow your patient time to respond to your external neurotransmitters, your catecholamines, your vasopressors, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, neosinephrine. Okay, so want to just remind you about the neurotransmitters because that's what we're supporting at the bedside. We are supporting your neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are like little lifeboats that carry activation across the space. That space is called the synapse. Carries the activation from the sympathetic nervous system, carries the activation across the synapse to the receptor site. That's really all it is. So when I give you norepinephrine, when I give you epinephrine, what I am doing is I'm increasing the activation at your receptor site. Now, if you had a spinal cord injury, that activation will just take the place of the sympathetic activation. But if you don't have a spinal cord injury and you're in shock, all I'm doing is I'm hyperstimulating the receptor sites. In order for your receptor sites, though, to respond, they must have normal ionic uh, gating and ionic presence. So all this means to you, my friends, is normal potassium and normal ionized calcium. And they have to have a relatively normal presence of one more ion that you will never measure, and that ion is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the metabolic acid. When hydrogen ion goes up, bicarb goes down, and you're in base deficit. So that means in those situations, alterations in potassium, hypocalcemia, ionized calcium, metabolic acidosis, those are going to disrupt my capability to respond to the internal and external catecholamines or neurotransmitters that I'm giving to my patient. Neurotransmitters act to open and close the ion channels. And if the ion channels cannot open or close, we cannot actually free calcium to give us vasoconstriction. 
So when you're titrating on norepinephrine, what I want you to remember is you probably have to be very, not probably, you must be very aware of ionic presence. Ions you can measure, potassium and calcium, and an ion that you assume, hydrogen ion, because that will interfere with your neurotransmitters. Now we're gonna just remind ourselves about the type of receptors so we can appreciate as we apply that to vasopressors, we appreciate what it is that we're doing. So we talk about adrenergic receptors and there's really two types of adrenergic receptors that we think of, that's alpha and beta. Alpha receptors are subdivided into two types. The first one is found in the smooth muscle, that's the lining of the artery, the heart, the liver, and when we stimulate alpha-1, our first goal will be to have vasoconstriction. And despite what you might think, it also promotes intestinal relaxation, can promote uterine contraction, we're not really worried about that, and pupillary dilation. Okay, alpha-2 is also found in vascular smooth muscle, and it's found in platelets, it helps to aggregate our platelets, and the termination of the nerve, which is called the terminal, and pancreatic isolates, which actually, of course, the isolates actually promote insulin. And so again, the thing I want you to think about here, when I'm using alpha-1, which I'm doing with norepinephrine and epinephrine, what I'm also going to see is some effect on alpha-2. So as I'm titrating up on your norepinephrine, I want you to see in your mind, your patient is creating small clots. He's aggregating his platelets. Your patient is generating insulin resistance. So the glucose is going to go up and their platelets are going to go down because they're aggregating platelets in the microvessels. Now, you know what? You're not thinking about that. What you're thinking about is, can I get that blood pressure up? But as you titrate up, 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 you need to be aware of the secondary effects that may occur as you are stimulating the alpha receptor sites. Beta receptor sites, particularly responsive to epinephrine and, and dobutamine. Now remember, alpha is primarily norepinephrine, also epinephrine, but primarily norepinephrine first and then epinephrine second. The beta receptor sites are very particularly uh, responsive to the administration of epinephrine or the circulating catecholamine epinephrine, as well as dobutamine. And there's three types of beta receptors. And I always like to remind you about these beta receptors. Beta-1 receptors are located mainly in the sinus node and the contractile mechanism of the heart. And when we're using beta-1 stimulation, you can never give beta-1 without beta-2. There's always going to be some beta-2. So the higher you go on those beta-1 agents, uh, that, that would be primarily dobutamine, the more you're going to see some secondary effect at beta-2. That's why we always start dobutamine at a really low dose, because we don't actually want to see you vasodilate, which is what beta-2 stimulation can do in the smooth muscle. So we're not really worrying about the beta-3 receptors. There's probably a lot to uncover there, but that's not what we're thinking about right here. Okay. And then the vasopressin receptors. So vasopressin receptors, as you might recall, vasopressin is released. It's made in the hypothalamus. It's released in the pituitary. We used to call it antidiuretic hormone until we realized that it had many properties, not just antidiuresis. The highest receptor affinity is in the V1 receptor, which promotes vasoconstriction and vascular smooth muscle and sets up a situation where receptor sites are more uh, responsive to circulating catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine. B2 receptors actually are the ones that promote antidiuresis and B3 receptors responsible for some other endocrine functions as well as platelet aggregation, making clots. Okay, so we use a relatively low dose that we do not titrate because we cannot predict what's gonna happen for the patient. We use a relatively low dose in the attempt to saturate the V1 receptors promoting vasoconstriction. Now, what I wanna say about vasoconstriction pressing because everybody uses it. It's generally the second or third agent that you're adding when you have a patient who is hypotensive. In general, 
the first agent, except in special circumstance, will be norepinephrine. The second agent will be either vasopressin or epinephrine, depending on the circumstance, depending on what your provider's uh, bias is. And by I don't mean bias in a bad way. I just mean what they've learned, how they trained, what their response is, how they've seen patients respond. It's all okay. They can do epi as a second. They can do vasopressin as a second. And then the third agent will be the one that they didn't do as the second. The beauty of the vasopressin receptors is that in metabolic acidosis, the vasopressin receptor does not have a high reliance on the ion gate, the channel of ions moving in and out of the cell. And so vasopressin can work quite well when we have patients with metabolic acidosis or abnormal potassium or calcium. And that's why we choose vasopressin. So we have to think about adding vasopressin really quickly in a patient who is refractory to norepinephrine or and epinephrine. We want to get vasopressin on board quickly. Now, as soon as you add vasopressin, you should see some responsiveness. And typically the responsiveness is the pressure comes up and you are now able to titrate down on your, on your epinephrine or your norepinephrine, just to titrate down slightly on norepinephrine or epinephrine. Lots of times we're not really looking at that response. All we're doing is trying to keep your mean pressure up because we want to keep it above 65 and it's 48 and we're just trying to get your mean arterial pressure up. But we need to be thinking about what's happening as we do that. So let's remember if I've got norepinephrine on board, I've got vasopressin on board and I am titrating my norepinephrine up, 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 up. I've added vasopressin the possibility is platelet aggregation in the microcirculation. What that actually converts to ultimately is occlusion to perfusion. And ultimately could actually be the underwriting structure for what you might call DIC, consumption of clotting products in the microvessels. Now, I want I don't want you to ever limit going up on norepinephrine for fear of platelet aggregation. I don't want you to limit going up on norepinephrine and epinephrine for fear of insulin resistance, but I do want you to pay attention to it. You need to pay attention to it. As I'm titrating up on norepinephrine, I need to be sure that I've got a patient who's on DVT prophylaxis, right? I need to be sure that my patient is mildly to moderately anticoagulated so I can reduce the risk that they're going to have these microclots. And I'm reducing the risk. I'm not obviating it. I'm just reducing it. And I also need to appreciate that as I'm titrating up on norepinephrine or epinephrine, I'm very sorry to tell you, you need to be measuring that blood glucose. And if that blood glucose is greater than 180, you need to go on a continuous insulin drip. As you titrate down on norepinephrine and epinephrine, you'll see the patient's blood glucose will drop. But remember, they basically have been made into an insulin resistant patient with that high dose of catecholamines. So let's just recall what the receptors do. Activation of alpha receptor leads to smooth muscle contraction. Activation of beta two receptors leads to smooth muscle relaxation, typically not our goal. Typically, we're going to add alpha receptor to con constrict the vascular smooth muscle that's primarily in the artery, secondarily in the vein, not at all in the capillary. And we're going to activate beta-1 receptors to actually enhance contraction of the myocardium, okay? It really doesn't have a strong effect on the smooth muscle of the vessels, much more so on the smooth or cardiac muscle of the heart. So my expectation when I start you on alpha stim, alpha stim, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine at higher dose and vasopressin is that you will have vasoconstriction of your blood vessels. And that's what I'm looking for. I need to be aware that there are other effects, but I am looking for evidence that you are vasoconstricting. That means your diastolic pressure goes up and your mean pressure should go up. With uh, beta-1 agents, I'm expecting an increased force of contraction, which means that if I'm monitoring your stroke volume, your stroke volume should go up. If I'm not monitoring your stroke volume, your systolic pressure should go up. And the difference between systole and diastole, systole minus diastole, that's pulse pressure. 
pulse pressure should improve. So I want a pulse pressure somewhere between 30 and 40. And so as I add a beta one stimulant and I'm increasing your cardiac con contract contraction, I want to see your pulse pressure increase. What may also happen, especially at a higher dose of your beta one stimulant, and that primarily is going to be dobutamine, is that your heart rate may go up and you may actually shorten your PO your PR interval. Now, I want to remind you, when the heart rate goes up, less time for filling. Shortening the PR interval, less time for active atrial contraction to ultimately fill the LV. So these are things I'm concerned about, which is why I always communicate with my provider. I want to start really low with dobutamine. As soon as I see that your heart rate significantly increases, I'm going to back off right? Because what's going to follow very shortly after that increase in heart rate is a drop in your blood pressure. So I want to start low and titrate upwards, but I must communicate that with my physician. You do not, I'm going to underscore this again, you do not have the privilege of titrating dobutamine without a physician or APP order. You do not titrate dobutamine without and order because the ischemic burden as you increase dobutamine is so profound. And as you increase dobutamine and you're on norepinephrine, you may now see vasodilation, which is completely controvertible to what it was you were trying to achieve. So this is just a very simple uh, relay of alpha, beta, and vasopressin receptors. Norepinephrine, almost all alpha, a little bit of beta, so it can increase contractility, and that tends to be at higher doses. Epinephrine is equal alpha and beta, which makes it really quite a nice agent, but it significantly increases your ischemic burden. Dopamine is dose dependent. It is alpha and beta, doesn't stimulate vasopressin. Vasopressin only stimulates the vasopressin receptors, and phenylephrine is the only absolutely pure alpha agent. So that's why phenylephrine, except in neurointensive care and with vasoplegia from anesthesia, phenylephrine is not the primary drug of choice because it's such a strong alpha agent, similar actually very similar to angiotensin, that it promotes such profound vasoconstriction and the heart has to work against that burden and it can really cause cardiac ischemia. So it tends not to be the primary agent except in very particular circumstance. Our primary agent will be norepinephrine and or epinephrine. Dopamine is used very... Uh, very gingerly in today's world. We don't use it a lot as a primary agent. It is used typically as a third or fourth agent or may be used early on in cardiac patients. We still see interventional cardiologists and cardiac intensivists will still order dopamine, but the activity of dopamine is so dosing related and you can't be sure of what dose you're giving the patient, even though you might read what the pharmacy says, it doesn't actually mean that that's what kind of effect it's gonna have. So now if we look at hypotension, we're gonna just divide into three categories here. Norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, and phenylephrine increase sympathetic activity and promote vasoconstriction. Vasopressin has nothing to do with sympathetic activity or uptake. And remember that uptake of the neurotransmitter requires the ion uh, gated channels that normal sodium, normal potassium, normal calcium, normal metabolic acid. Vasopressin works directly at the vascular surface, promoting vasoconstriction. So it's a fantastic drug of choice in a metabolic acidosis state or in a state where you have some concern about the patient's ions. Angiotensin II actually works at the renin angio or works at the end result of the renin angiotensin stimulation, promoting very, very profound vasoconstriction and secondarily affecting the release of aldosterone, promoting water and salt reabsorption. So what happens to you every day at the bedside? It's really not at all uncommon that you have patients who are not responding. So what does that mean to you? It means when your patients aren't responding, titrating up is fine. You should do that. That's what you need to do. But you need to be asking some questions. You need to be asking questions about the vasodilation effect of metabolic acidosis, you need to be asking questions about your patient's ions, their potassium, 
their calcium. Oh, you gave five units of PAC cells, but you didn't replace calcium. Your patient is now hypocalcemic because citrate, which pr protects your red cells from clotting, binds calcium. You need to be thinking every day at the bedside. When my patient doesn't respond to this excessive neurotransmitter that I'm giving, norepinephrine, epinephrine, maybe dopamine, maybe phenylephrine, my patient isn't responding, something else is going on. And you need to investigate what that is. Severe metabolic acidosis, not respiratory, metabolic acidosis profoundly affects cardiovascular function and vascular tone. Our vessels release a profound abundance of mediators that can promote vasodilation, vasoconstriction. We're going to see some uh, new additions to our armamentarium that are coming in the future, a little beyond where I want to be right now. But what I want to remind you is that in stress, your vessel is going to release nitric oxide, which is a profound vasodilator. So in stress, your patient can release nitric oxide, which promotes vasodilation. This is why we give you corticosteroids, because that can reduce the production of nitro nitric oxide. So that's the main thing that we're talking about here is my patient is refractory to my catecholamines and he's on norepinephrine, epinephrine, vasopressin. I've tried to normalize his pH and his metabolic acid level, but now I have to think, is it possible that he's releasing nitric oxide? And in order to block that, I'm going to give corticosteroids. I want to remind you as well, very, very important, okay? Two things that we can measure and we can measure effectively, potassium, and the opposer of hydrogen, which is your bicarb or your base. So with bicarb and base are down, hydrogen is up. That's going to significantly alter your vessel diameter, and it's going to reduce your vascular response. So what does that mean to you? It means vasopressin quick, corticosteroid quick, and consider angiotensin II because your catecholamines, your neurotransmitters, when you have these ionic abnormalities, your neurotransmitters are not gonna work in order to enhance your vascular tone. So I'm gonna kind of end here with Mr. Mister, if you've got another minute. Mr. Mister is a status post uh, male, witnessed out of hospital arrest, his initial rhythm was unknown. Uh, Later on, the presumption was that he was hypokalemic because he had been diuresis for his heart failure. There was immediate bystander CPR. ROSC was achieved after 10 minutes. He got uh, uh, EMS arrived. They gave three shocks. He had return of spontaneous circulation, intact neural function, and hemodynamically stable when he gets to the ED. His troponin is 87. It has no meaning here because he's gotten shocked. And the EKG does not have a STEMI, although we did have a very significant uh, LAD occlusion. He did go to the cath lab. He did have an LAD occlusion. He was admitted to cardiovascular ICU for post-stress care and inotrope assisted diuresis. So he gets placed on dobutamine and then he gets diuresed in the setting of his cardiogenic shock. Three days later, he has a hypoxic event. He has another V-fib arrest with a very prolonged resuscitation, greater than an hour. There was a lot of concern for PE. He was not on any vasopressors. He was stable. He was walking around. He was doing great. But now all of a sudden, he's uptunded. And there was a concern for PE, got some alteplase. And from the alteplase, he suffered a massive hemorrhage. He was hemorrhaging from his ET tube and from a was line placement. He got four units of whole blood, uh-oh, and one of FFP, platelets, cryo, and started on pressors. Pressors were titrated up, 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 up. He's on 150 of norepinephrine and 130 of epinephrine. His mean pressure is 60, and he's writing notes. He's writing notes. But then he had another issue with worsening shock, despite the fact that he was on max levo, max epi, vasopressin, 10 of dopamine, 15 of dobutamine. He got methylene blue, which actually chelates nitric oxide, also getting steroids. Don't know if he got calcium, couldn't find that in the chart, but really poor forward flow. Discussion is he needs mechanical support and actually he needs VA ECMO. And he got, we don't do VA ECMO, so we got transported for VA ECMO. And he's actually 
So this patient just left our unit today. He's on ECMO and he's doing pretty well. On his echocardiogram, he had a dilated right ventricle. He had LV dysfunction. He had a, a left ventricular ejection fraction of around 20, 25%, which then deteriorated to around 5%. So he really had significant alteration. He's only like 46. And the assumption would be, from my point of view, is that he had viral cardiomyopathy and was not diagnosed until January of this year. And then he had a, uh, he was uh, diuresing himself. He wasn't paying attention. He had a hypokinemic cardiac arrest. He himself said that's what he thought happened because he's had problems with his potassium before. And he wasn't always compliant with taking the potassium supplementation. So this is his initial chemistry. This is on admission. You can see his KS33. Remember, cardiac patients always need to have a potassium of around four. So of course, that's a bit concerning. You can see that his uh, creatinine is a little elevated. He has very poor GFR. He does actually go into renal failure and he goes on CRT. And we take a look at this. So I want to remind you when you have a venous blood gas, because he didn't have an arterial gas, he only had a venous gas. When you see that venous PO2 is 47, this may indicate to you, A, that your patient doesn't need that oxygen or B, that he might need it and he can't use it. But what's confounding here is that your patient is alkalotic. Okay, so just as a reminder, when patients are aggressively diuresing, their lab values can look alkalotic when they are profoundly acidotic. So beyond the scope of this discussion, but we've talked about it before, I'll probably talk about it again. This is what's known as the gap. It's a uh, anion gap gap. It's a gap that tells us that on top of what we see as metabolic alkalosis, he has a base excess, he has an alkalotic pH. What we actually see is the patient may have underlying metabolic acidosis. So something to always question when a patient has been over-diuresed, they've over-diuresed themselves, you've over-diuresed them, what will appear on the blood gas will look like alkalosis, but what you have to question in reality is, is there actually acidosis? So here you see that his gap is a little elevated, it's 15, but if we did a correction for his metabolic al alkalosis, his gap was actually around 21. Okay, now this is on the day of his code, that would be this morning. Okay, you can see that he's well oxygenated, his pH looks great, his CO2 is great, but he has a base deficit. Okay, so very important. It's not profound, certainly not the worst I've ever seen. I, actually, this patient looks like he was extraordinarily well managed. But here's his potassium again, and I just want to remind you about potassium. Got to keep potassium of cardiac patient at four or greater. He is on amiodarone. That's another reason to make sure his potassium is four or greater. Okay, so I wanna remind you when vasopressors aren't working and for this patient, they appear to be working because his map was 60 or 65, but you're using extraordinary vasopressor. What that tells you is you may have a failure of your neurotransmitter uptake because you may have ionic abnormalities. So focus on potassium, focus on calcium. When we look at that patient, we see his potassium was down, his calcium was down, and focus on metabolic acidosis. These are things we have to think about when vasopressors aren't working to restore vascular tone. Okay, so now you just remind yourself that there is one other opportunity. In general, we do not ever think about putting patients on angiotensin if they have heart failure, because it's such a profound vasoconstrictor, it can put an extraordinary burden on the myocardium. But it is something to discuss when you have patients with refractory hypotension. Remember the neurotransmitters rely on that ionic gate. You may not even know if that's the problem, but hormones, vasopressin, cortisol, and angiotensin II do not rely on the ionic gate. So it doesn't matter about acidosis. It doesn't really matter about ionized potassium or ionized calcium. 
You should actually be discussing it. Doesn't mean everyone's going to say, yippee, you're so smart. They're, they're going to discuss it and they're going to say yes or no. Maybe I'll consider it. Let's apply it. Oh, what a great idea. What a terrible idea. The evidence says whatever. You've got to bring it forward to have a discussion. So you can see what happens. This is in a hemorrhagic patient. This is from 2011. Looking at patients who do not have a renin-angiotensin system, they cannot restore vascular tone. If you have a, a, a focused renin-angiotensin system, you can actually restore arterial pressure. So just remember, blood flow and volume through the kidney promotes the release. When that's reduced, we release renin, which converts through angiotensinogen released from the liver to angiotensin one that's converted to angiotensin two. And that is a profound vasoconstrictor. So really powerful. It's a vasoconstrictor that works in many areas of the body and it works fast. You will know within one hour if angiotensin works. So by the way, if the concern is expense, I'm just gonna put it on the patient. They either get better or they don't. I'm not gonna continue. Like I continue with norepinephrine, epinephrine, and vasopressin, whether the patient's responding or not, not gonna continue with angiotensin II if the patient isn't responding. And it works directly at the kidney to retain salt and water. Okay, very, very important when we think about that. So angiotensin II, also known as Gopressa, starts with 20 nanograms per kilogram per minute. Typically, when you start, you see a response almost immediately. You can titrate by uh, 15 nanograms per kilogram. Your protocol may be a little less. It might be 10 every five minutes. So it requires that there's a nurse and a pharmacist at the bedside. You're titrating up. The highest you can go is 80. And after you recruit the blood pressure, if you can, you now will titrate down to the maintenance dose of 40. Five minutes to target mean arterial pressure. Half-life is less than one minute. But this angiotensin II does promote platelet aggregation. The most profound secondary effect that occurred in studies was an increase in DVT. There were no life-threatening PEs in the study, but that doesn't mean that in the general application, there have not been life-threatening uh, PEs. So I talked today with uh, one of the providers that took care of Mr. Mister. I said, I know that we don't normally consider angiotensin II in a heart failure patient, but indeed they were discussing it, but then the patient got transferred for VA ECMO, which is exactly what he needed. We needed to bypass his lungs and his heart. And that's, we really needed to bypass his heart, but you can't just bypass the heart, you have to bypass the heart and the lungs. So he's now on ECMO and has woken up and is communicating and looks like he's become relatively stable. There was discussion about the fact that his vasopressors have been almost titrated off. They're talking about extubation tomorrow. So God willing, all things go forward. And I wanna congratulate the CVICU here at Grady Hospital. Fantastic job of managing this very difficult patient and keeping him alive until he could go for ECMO. And he was young. So everything, almost everything was thrown at him. Congratulations, everyone. I hope that in summary, you appreciate that what we really care about is blood flow and that when we're using vasoconstrictors, we're enhancing vascular tone to maintain that arterial venous gradient to maintain blood flow. And to always consider when our patients are refractory, that means their vascular tone is not responding. Consider what else may be wrong in terms of how you look at the patient and how you manage the patient. I wanna thank you very much for attending today's Tuesday Topics. I'm going to stop recording and say goodbye for now. Thank you so much and 